Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Subhash Basu from Manchester, United Kingdom. Dr. Basu is a consultant and musculoskeletal radiologist with his private practice based in Cheshire, Manchester, Lancashire, and London. His NHS base is at Ridington Hospital, Lancashire, United Kingdom. Dr. Basu graduated from the St. Bartholomew's and Royal London School of Medicine and Dentistry in the University of London. He then completed general clinical radiology and higher subspecialty training in musculoskeletal imaging at the Northwest Deanery School of Radiology in Manchester. This was followed by further subspecialist training during a one year MSK in sports medicine imaging fellowship at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, London. Dr. Basu holds positions as visiting professor at Manchester Metropolitan University and also senior honorary lecturer at the University of Salford, where he is passionately involved in the education of postgraduate students. He lectures at both national and international meetings, as well as very keen on publishing his work in top-notch journals. So today, it's my great honor to introduce you, Dr. Subhashish Basu from the United Kingdom. What do you, Dr. Basu? Thank you, Dr. Gopalan. Thank you so much for the uh, kind invitation to speak today. And it's a, it's a great pleasure and an honor for me um, to um, share some of my kind of radiology knowledge with, with all of you out there. And the topic of conversation today is going to focus around imaging of hip arthroplasty. So uh, my name is Sawasis Basu, and I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist. If there's any queries or questions, feel free to ask or drop, drop me a line on Twitter, etc. cetera. Um, just as a background, uh, my, NHS my NHS practice is based in the UK, uh, primarily at Wrightington Hospital. And you can see an image there of, of, of the kind of space that we work in. It's a beautiful place, especially when the weather's nice. But unfortunately here in the UK, the weather isn't always nice. Um, but I'm very fortunate enough to work in a, in a specialist orthopedic unit with at least around about 40 orthopedic surgeons, all super specialized in their own areas. And this helps me to develop my own practice as well as continuous, continuous learning. So moving on, uh, hip replacement surgery or hip arthroplasties are one of the most successful surgical procedures um, that, we, that we know. Um, why? Because it gives good pain relief, it restores hip joint function, and it improves the quality of life in more than 90% of patients, particularly those with end-stage degenerative hip uh, disease. A lot of you may recognize this gentleman, uh, Sir John Charnley, who is an absolute pioneer, and you know we hold him in great esteem and respect, particularly at Wrightington, where he practiced. Um, and he, uh, as we know it, is the pioneer, if you like, of the modern day low friction hip arthroplasty systems. But it wasn't just the hip replacements that he, that he, invent he invented in terms of technique. He also introduced the PMA bone cement for fixation um, amongst other things, he introduced the high density polyethylene as a, as a bearing surface, as well as working in the laboratories and making advances in, in biomaterial and biomechanics, as well as various operating techniques um, and uh, evolving around operative instruments and operative environments, which are in very much in use uh, today worldwide. So, um, with the improvements and developments in the bearing materials, you know, the implant designs and fixation techniques, these all kind of have kind of evolved over time. And it's very important if one works with these kind of things to, to, be a, to keep abreast of, of things. Now we know that patient satisfaction um, incre increases and improves with, with increasing implant durability. Um, however, pain after hip arthroplasty still remains um, in, a, in a quite a wide range of, of cohorts of patients, ranging from just over half a percent up to nearly half, 40% of, of all patients. So what imaging tools do we have in our kind of, in our kind of armory, if you like, to be able to investigate uh, these such symptoms? So I've listed a few here. The commonest tends to be uh, plain films or radiographs, and you may well want to do some dynamic imaging with fluoroscopy in the intraoperative theater setting. Ultrasound, CT, and MRI are probably the next most common imaging modalities that are utilized. And more and more, you're now going to start to see the increasing use of nuclear medicine studies, for example, bone scans, which have always been there if, in all respect, but now we're gonna see a lot more interest develop around PET CT or SPECT CT. So just to go back to some basic principles, um, you know, before all the advent of all these other imaging modalities like CT and MRI, 
Um, we always dealt with plain films or radiographs. And I always go back to a radiograph when I come to report my cross-sectional imaging like MRI scans. I feel lost without them. And it's very important because a lot of the answers can be there. If you follow all the various lines, it can actually delineate all the various and key parts of anatomy that one needs to know. So I've just kind of highlighted here what the various lines um, look at. So you know, if you look at line number one and follow that on the, on the plain film at the bottom, that outlines the anterior, anterior rim of the acetabulum. And likewise, line number two outlines the posterior margin of the acetabulum. If you look at line number three, the acetabular roof line is outlined and then four, five, and six delineate the iliopectineal line, the ilioischial line, and the acetabular teardrop sign. Now these are crucial and I'll come on to why now. So the anterior and posterior walls of the acetabulum are pretty self-explanatory, but if you see disruptions in, in these lines on the plain film, then you're already suspecting that there might be something wrong, even before you go on to investigate with CT or MRI perhaps. The acetabular roof line or the saw sill corresponds with the kind of central weight bearing surface, which has an increased sclerotic line. And then the iliopectineal line and the ilioischial line essentially defines the margins of the anterior and posterior columns. So again, very important to be able to follow these lines on an X-ray. Finally, the acetabular teardrop is essentially formed laterally from the medial portion of the acetabulum, um, whilst it is formed medially by the uh, posterior wall or the anterior inferior portion of the quadrilateral plate. So coxa profunda, what is it? Well, it's an acetabular fossa that's typically too deep. And you see these on well-centered pelvic radiographs. What happens in coxa profunda on the radiograph is the acetabular roof line is seen medial to the ilioischial line. And here's an example showing just that. I've just uh, magnified the views of the X-ray on the uh, top right there. But that essentially shows how the acetabular roof line has now moved medial to the ilioischial line. This is in the plain film example of coxa profunda or a deep socket. Another term for a deep socket can be protrusio acetabuli, and I've often seen both of these terms used interchangeably in various reports. However, yes, the acetabular fossa is also deep in protrusio acetabuli, but the plain film manifestation of this is medialization of the femoral head, seen again on pelvis radiographs that are essentially well centered. The medial border of the femoral head is seen medial to the ilioischial line this time. And here's an example of what protrusio acetabuli can look like on the image on the left. So here's just an outline of what um, normal looks like in the, in the center image. And then on the left, we have protrusio acetabuli. And on the right, we have coxa profunda. So radiographs are essentially the primary modality imaging of choice at the start when you're assessing, when you're assessing patients with painful hip replacements and often form the kind of uh, typical standard routine surveillance imaging that we have. Uh, the key things to look out for on the radiographs essentially include the position of the hip replacement, particularly any early surgical complications in the post-operative setting. So we are looking at periprosthetic fractures. We're looking at the baseline radiographs post-operatively. And it's very important to really to ensure you have two projections so that there is something to go back to as a reference um, for future. In terms of classification of the zones, uh, Dali and Charnley classified the acetabular component with three defined zones as highlighted in the image on the left. And then the femoral component can also be broken down into Gruen zones, zones one to seven on an AP projection and on the lateral projection, uh, zones eight to 14. I must admit that I don't routinely use these uh, zonal anatomies in my reports, but perhaps, you know, it's important to be aware of this because when we're having conversations with surgeons um, or radiologists on the phone or an NDT, you know, if you have, if you have an understanding of these zones, it makes, it makes it a lot easier. Moving on to ultrasound briefly. Well, ultrasound is, is a good imaging modality to use when you're assessing uh, for any underlying joint effusions. Uh, assessment for synovitis or any, any periarticular collections. Uh, ultrasound is also very good at looking at the tendons and looking for any distended bursi. The good thing about ultrasound is it's not hampered by the metal artifact that one will get um, when you have uh, hip replacements in situ. However, it is highly dependent both on the operator, so the person performing the ultrasound scan, it's very important to ensure that whoever does the ultrasound is well versed and is well trained in this. 
Um, but also I've mentioned here patient dependent. So some patients may not be able to tolerate lying um, on their back or on their side due to pain, or some patients are actually too um, sensitive to the, to the pressures that one has to place with the ultrasound probe to scan. So these are some of the limitations potentially on what is otherwise a relatively easily accessible imaging modality and cheap imaging modality to use. Here's an example of an ultrasound guided aspiration uh, in a patient that was uh, considered for infection. And we can see that the white arrow um, actually points to a kind of dark area, something that we describe as a hypochoic um, joint effusion in somebody with a hip replacement. The black arrow indicates the needle that's entered into the uh, joint under ultrasound guidance. And this was aspirated with the samples then sent off to microbiology for, for culture and sensitivity. Moving on to CT, well, the advantage, advantages of CT are it can assess for things like osteolysis around a component. It can assess the implant position as well as the integrity, so you can get metalwork failure. It's good at assessing for periprosthetic fractures um, as well as looking at things like heterotopic ossification. I, I'm, I'm going to come on to uh, some of the complications around hip arthroplasties later on in the talk. MRI, I guess, is one of the mainstay um, imaging modalities now in musculoskeletal imaging. Um, but one has to just draw a bit of caution when it comes to assessment for metal work and, and hip replacements. We know MRI has a superior soft tissue contrast, particularly when you compare it with CT. Um, the anatomical detail to evaluate the inter interfaces between the cement implant and bone implant is crucial. And this is where MRI can sometimes have a bit of a drawback due to metal artifact. So for me, the key thing is to ensure that I can see those interfaces well, um, but that isn't always the case as we all know. Uh, other things that MRI can assess for are periarticular uh, soft tissues, um, assessment of the pseudocapsule itself, and just like an ultrasound, we can also assess the surrounding tendons and neurovascular structures. MRI within its limitations can also look for things like synovial proliferation or any periarticular soft tissue masses or adverse local soft tissue reactions, uh, complications that I will come on to as well later on in the presentation. So I mentioned about the metal work susceptibility artifact that one gets with MRI. And how many times have you come across reports that say image degradation due to metal artifact, um, accurate assessment cannot be made? Well, I, I beg to differ. I think if you and the radiographers in the institution um, can work at uh, optimizing the imaging techniques, there are very good ways of being able to assess structures in and around a prosthesis. And the key things are now to use the MARS sequences, which stands for metal artifact reduction. And this is important, particularly if you want to improve the visualization of those interfaces around the, the bone or the cement arthroplasty interfaces, as well as the synovium. A typical protocol for arthroplasty imaging, certainly at our center, would involve the following. So we tend to stick with coronal T1, uh, T2 and STIR sequences, uh, axial T1 and T2 sequences, and then also in the sagittal plane T2 sequences. Um, and, you know, the, the multi kind of planar reformatting, if you like, or the multiplanar acquisition of MRI is, 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 is an, adva an advantage when it comes to assessment of hip arthroplasties. And then you may also obtain Mars sequences, those metal artifact reduction sequences in all three planes. I must say the T1 is crucial for me. The T1 is what I deem the truth sequence because it gives you an anatomical representation of what's happening. And then a T2 is very good when you're looking for any kind of fluid collections and STIR often accentuates any uh, fluid collections. Try and avoid fat suppressed sequences. And I'll come on to that in a second. What kind of techniques can your radiographer in the radiology department utilize to try and reduce metal artifact? Well, the 1.5 Tesla MRI scan has generally been the workhorse for MSK imaging. Um, but now as more and more 3T MRI systems come onto stream and in some countries 3T is often the norm, we often know that the, the, the 1.5 Tesla scanner can actually provide the better imaging due to lower uh, magnetic field strength. However, both systems do incorporate um, metal artifact reduction sequences. And I do know that vendors are constantly trying to improve software to try and optimize that. But other techniques that are generic to both types of scanners include increasing the receiver bandwidth and also use, using the inversion recovery sequences. So as I mentioned, STIR, 
as opposed to fat suppression sequences. The fat suppressions don't seem to work well at all and will often give you more artifacts. So try and stay clear of that. Finally, decreasing the voxel size is also quite a useful adjunct. So uh, some of the different types of hip arthroplasties include metal on polyethylene, ceramic on polyethylene, ceramic on ceramic and metal on metal um, hip replacement constructs. And I'll touch on some of these now. So the key thing to ensure with a total hip arthroplasty is optimal position. And why? Well, that ensures you have good stability and it also minimizes the risks of failure or premature failure of the hip replacement, as well as things like loosening and periprosthetic fractures. Stability with a wide range of movement is basically the, the aim of, 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 of a good um, surgical outcome. And with that, that is dependent on uh, a few parameters such as the acetabular abduction angle, the acetabular antiversion, and also the femoral antiversion. And a so-called safe zone that can be measured on plain films um, include a 45 degree uh, angle of the cup abduction, 15 degree cup antiversion, and approximately 15 degrees of femoral antiversion. Now, please don't take these values as absolute. You know, they often aren't, and we often work within a range. The femoral stem should also uh, typically be positioned in a kind of mild valgus position with the distal tip usually centered or medial to the medullary canal. Looking at hip resurfacing arthroplasty, it's essentially a non-cemented acetabular component with a non-cemented femoral component that's pegged with a metal cap covering the femoral head. The femoral neck is often preserved to allow for any future conversion to a total hip replacement with a femoral shaft stem. In terms of implant fixation, there are two types. You can get cemented versus non-cemented, and you can also get the hybrid, which is a combination of the two or reverse hybrid systems. The cementless fixations do create a durable and biological and mechanical link between the implant itself and the native host bone. This is facilitated through the interdigitation of bone into coated implant surfaces. And this is important when we're looking at those follow-up imaging radiographs. So in a well-fixed implant, you can see an image on the left, which is taken pretty soon after uh, surgery. And the image, the radiograph on the right is a serial radiograph taken during surveillance several months down the line. And you can see there's good apposition of the bone implant interface. There's no eccentric um, radiolucency around the stem. You can see on the image on the left, the white arrow is pointing to a bit of bony ingrowth around the proximal prosthesis. And this corresponds to a little increased sclerosis there when you compare that with the image on the left. Finally, stress shielding is an important process where the implant shifts physiological load away from a particular region. The greater, uh, the greater trochanter as well as the medial calcar tend to be the commonest sites. And the gray arrow on the top, uh, on, the, on, the, on the image on the left demonstrates uh, how stress shielding can look like on, on, on a radiograph. So these are crucial to, to be aware of and not be mistaken for abnormalities. On MRI, we can see here, these are both axial uh, sequences, and these have been taken through the top of the socket, if you like. And the image on the left demonstrates a really nice image. This is what I'd like to be able to see every time I open an MRI scan. It doesn't always happen though. And we can see a nice interface between the acetabular and the femoral component, which is the image on the, on the, on the right, showing good cancellous bone um, apposition alongside the native um, bone. Moving on to complications and implant failure now. So the commonest complications that we tend to see include loosening, infection, periprosthetic fractures, synovitis and adverse local tissue reactions, which are often due to implant wear, tendinopathy, for example, psoas tendon irritation, heterotopic ossification, and also neuropathy. And I'm gonna to touch on all of these now um, one by one. In the context of mechanical loosening and membrane formation, loosening is often defined as a complete loss of fixation at surgery. Up to 60% of hip replacements are revised due to loosening. Mechanical or aseptic loosening um, is defined when the infection workup is negative and there is absence of any significant wear-induced synovitis. Now the process that takes place usually is, is an element of mechanical stress 
that leads to synoviocytes that migrate towards that bone cement and bone implant interface. And then they start to form these synovial-like membranes or fibrous tissue formation, which are kind of delineated as these demarcated zones. And there they start to release osteoclast stimulating cytokines, which is why you start to develop bone resorption. That, mem that membranous formation and bone resorption along those interfaces actually precedes loosening. So it's very important to follow up on all these on serial imaging. So here's an example of early loosening signs in a ceramic on ceramic hip construct. The image on the left is an AP radiograph and the arrows delineate a thin lucency in zone one with a little bit of adjacent sclerosis. If you move to the middle and right image, which are MRI coronal and axial sequences, they now demonstrate a fibrous membrane formation, which is defined as intermediate or high signal um, at the acetabular roof and anterior wall. And there is a low signal band of uh, sclerosis. You can see the black arrow on the image on the left demonstrates how it should look when you have good integration, osseous integration, and that's the posterior wall, which is nicely opposed. In terms of loosening radiographically, if you see any bony resorption or osteolysis that measures less than one millimeter, it's deemed to be clinically insignificant, but it's something just to keep an eye on. Anything that measures between one and two millimeters depth of osteolysis represents a degree of membrane formation. And this certainly warrants image surveillance. You should really follow these patients up with serial radiographs. Any lucency that's greater than two millimeters, particularly when you see eccentric lucency represents localized loosening, and that is of concern. Other signs of loosening include component migration, progressive or non-parallel divergent lucency. So that's essentially what I was saying before when it came to eccentric osteolysis, and that can happen around the bone or at the cement mantle and bone interface. Other features to look out for are endosteal scalloping and also bony hypertrophy at the tip of the uh, femoral stem. In terms of polyethylene wear, all components generally undergo a degree of wear and shedding of the debris. Polyethylene debris has high inflammatory profiles and that again leads on to the cytokine mediated, in, uh, mediated increased osteoclast activity and that in turn leads to the osseous resorption that we see. Polyethylene wear rates are actually very small in the grand context of things. So, you know, it can range from less than 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters per year. And newer cross-link materials that are developed for these hip constructs have even reduced wear profiles. So what does component wear and synovitis on MRI look like? So you can get pseudocapsule distension uh, with low to intermediate signal debris and fluid. The fact that the pseudocapsule um, fills with fluid can lead to increased intraarticular pressures, and then that fluid has to leak out or decompress somewhere. Often you see fluid decompression anteriorly into the iliopsoas bursa, and I'll show you some images in a second. And finally, osteolysis with the replacement of the normal marrow signal adjacent to the implant, and we've seen some examples already. So here's an example of polyethylene wear-induced synovitis. So the images include an axial T1 image, and you can see the arrows on the left pointing at the front to the pseudocapsule expanding anteriorly as a synovium proliferates. And the image on the right demonstrates decompression of fluid into the iliopsoas bursa with a thickened wall and um, fluid presence, as well as some low signal debris inside. So this is an example of wear-induced synovitis. Also, you can see at the posterior margins, the gray arrow pointing to localized osteolysis, which would be equivalent on the radiographs to Gruen zones one and 14. So here we can see examples of a mixed uh, fluid collection and debris in the, in the pseudocapsule in the joint that's decompressing anteriorly, but you've also got some osseous component of um, wear-induced change in the, uh, in the bone as well. Here's an example um, of some coronal images, again, of polyethylene wear induced synovitis. So we have uh, a proton density or intermediate signal uh, sequence scan on the left and an image of the stir sequence on the right. And you can see these bulky uh, geographical areas of osteolysis involving the acetabular roof margins on both sides of the hip. And at the same time, you can see um, some localized distension of the pseudocapsule, particularly on the right side where the smaller arrow is highlighting distension of the pseudocapsule with synovitis and debris. 
So moving on to the term adverse local soft tissue reactions, which can often be abbreviated to ALTR. So these local soft tissue reactions encompass various reactions in the presence of either metal ions, um, metal debris, and corrosion products, particularly in these contexts of metal on metal uh, hip replacements. ALTR can include hypersensitivity reactions to metal products in the context or in the setting of low wear, high wear, and metallosis. And you can see a combination of all these as well. One thing that's crucial is to make sure that you take serum measurements of the cobalt and chromium levels in your patients as a guide. Now, you may come across reports, I certainly do, where the terms pseudotumor and adverse reaction to metal debris are often used synonymously. Um, and, you know, the, these are the kind of terms that I would use in my radiology report. I refrain from using the term pseudotumor when there is no metal on metal hip construct. So when can you get these adverse local soft tissue reactions? Well, you can get them in generally well positioned, but also badly or mal positioned um, arthroplasty systems. The metal products can shed. So you can see little small metal ionic debris shedding into the periprosthetic soft tissues. The wear can accelerate, particularly when the arthroplasty alignment is outside that safe zone that I described earlier with those various angular measurements. Um, and therefore optimal component positioning is usually quite well, very crucial. Also to be aware of is fretting and corrosion at the head, neck and neck stem junctions and the so-called trunionosis. The findings on MRI of, of pseudotumors or adverse local soft tissue reactions include the mixed synovitis changes of fluid and debris that we saw earlier. You can get dehiscence of the pseudocapsule. You can get surrounding soft tissue edema as well as osteolysis. You can get abductor disruption and I'll come on to that in a, in a, in a second. Neurovascular compromise and localized adenopathy are the other features that you can see as well. So here's an MRI, exa MRI example of a metal on metal hip uh, uh, exhibiting a large adverse local soft tissue reaction. You can see the black arrow pointing to the disruption of the posterior pseudocapsule with fluid uh, leaking out or dehissing into the posterior soft tissue envelope. And this kind of extends all the way around laterally into the trochanteric bursa. The white arrow at the bottom demonstrates a thick rind of fluid, and there's also um, the, the, the degree of thickness often delineates or uh, signifies the aggressiveness of the lesion. There's also some slow signal change anteriorly delineated by the gray arrow at the front there, um, just anterior to the gray trochanter, which may reflect some solid uh, metal debris. The image on the left here demonstrates again an axial image of a different patient with a metal on metal hip construct. And again, you see disruption to the posterior pseudocapsule and dehiscence with fluid and synovitis essentially enveloping the posterior soft tissue envelope. The gray arrow on the left demonstrates a sciatic nerve and you can see that the, the fat planes around that nerve are completely effaced. So I would not be surprised if this patient also complains of sciatic type symptoms. And this is something to be aware of because you can often get localized sciatic nerve irritation. And usually sciatic nerve can also get tethered due to the chronic uh, soft tissue inflammatory changes around the posterior soft tissue envelope. In this instance, a differential diagnosis also included infection, which had to be excluded. So this patient went on to have an ultrasound guided aspiration. And you've seen this image already in the talk um, showing the ultrasound guided aspiration here. In terms of classification of metal and metal pseudotumors, um, certainly in the UK, we can uh, utilize three uh, different classifications based on the Oxford or the Norwich or the Imperial um, classification systems. The Oxford classification, classification system focuses on the wall thickness and the degree of whether there's greater fluid or solid components within the pseudotumor. The Norwich classification system looks at the size of the entire lesion, as well as any surrounding soft tissue and bony osseous changes. And the imperial classification looks at the combination of above. I must admit with our reports and in our center, we have very good communications with, with our surgeons and we have regular MDTs. And my suggestion to any budding radiologist would be to report and describe the findings rather than worrying too much about classifications. So in terms of pseudotumors, it's important to also remember that just by having a pseudotumor does not mean a patient is automatically symptomatic. A lot of these patients are often asymptomatic and actually function really well despite the presence of it. 
So the key questions that our surgeons have to think around are what, what are the key things that we need to do here with a patient that's asymptomatic effectively, but does demonstrate pseudotumors on imaging? Do we continue to survey these patients and, and perform annual imaging? Do we electively revise the patient or do we urgently revise the patient? And I guess this is the, this is the difficulty that we have in clinical practice. Some patients are very reluctant to undergo uh, a revision um, if they're functioning well and able to perform their activities of daily living with relative ease. However, we do know that if we leave these things going on for some time, the revision can get, can get more complicated, particularly if the degree of pseudotumor um, worsens with more osseous changes. So just touching a little bit on metal on metal hip arthroplasty, uh, here's an example, an axial image demonstrating bilateral metal and metal hips with florid pseudotumor formation. And you can see, particularly on the left side, this large high signal fluid collection that's decompressed uh, through the posterior pseudocapsule into the posterior soft tissue envelope. And it's actually breached the fascia through the gluteal um, muscles and also the overlying ITB. And this actually went on to form a sinus tract as it extended into the cutaneous uh, surface. There is a much smaller um, pseudotumor, which is predominantly fluid based on the right side. And also in the right hip, you can also maybe appreciate just anteriorly, um, the iliopsoas bursa is distended with some fluid and some debris uh, with a thickened wall. Here's a coronal sequence of the same patient. This is a coronal stir, which basically darkens everything else in terms of the bone marrow and the soft tissues, but fluid remains bright. And you can see the fluid-based pseudotumor extension um, on the left. And here's a sagittal sequence of the, of the same hip that demonstrates that bright fluid speck just adjacent to the gluteal tendon insertions at the waist trochanter there posteriorly. And anteriorly, there's more of a solid pseudotumor component as well. And these are often a little bit more trickier to, to delineate and find. So here's just an intraoperative picture of a, of a revision um, of, of said patient. And uh, this is what those pseudotumors actually look like. And I apologize for my my Indian friends who are probably having their dinner or just completed their, their evening dinner um, for these pictures, but here's what the, uh, the pseudotumors look like. And these are often really big. I mean, look at this, this, this measures nearly six inches. And I often compare this to something like my homemade lasagna. Um, so I, I always seem to put that in into, into this talk, but actually this pseudotumor that was extracted and revised um, was of this patient. Moving on to infection. So periprosthetic infection um, is very difficult to diagnose often, and it can require multimodality imaging, um, as well as image-guided aspiration to get actual firm tissue samples for confirmation. Serological tests include your common white cell counts, your CRP and ESR, those inflammatory markers, which have a good sensitivity, but do have a poor specificity. And so they cannot be relied on um, solely. CRP and ESR can normally rise, remember, after uh, surgery, um, with CRP falling around about three weeks after surgery, and ESR can take up to six weeks post-operative before it starts to um, show a steady decline. Radiographs, being the initial imaging workup, um, can show periosteal reactions and osteolysis in the setting of infection, but it's still important to remember that the x-rays or plain films remain insensitive and non-specific, particularly in the early um, evolutionary stages of infection. Similar findings on radiographs can also be attributed to aseptic loosening as well as stress reactions as we've seen earlier. And also now um, with nuclear medicine uh, imaging becoming an increasing um, part of our uh, infection workup, you know, isotope bone scans do tend to be slightly insensitive, but better sensitivity is reported when you combine things like bone scans and white cell scans, which is another talk uh, in itself. And I must say that in our center, we have moved on with, with, with not just relying on bone scans, but combining that with SPECT uh, CT scans to try and improve the sensitivity and specificity of our imaging. So what are the common signs of infection to look for in MRI? I've just listed them there. And they include things like joint effusion, extracapsular synovial or osseous bone marrow edema, which can enhance, particularly if you've used contrast on your MRI study. Extracapsular collections or certainly osseous or bony destruction or erosive changes 
can um, point towards an infective process. And then reactive lymphadenopathy, which isn't necessarily a, a telltale sign of infection, but you do see lymph node enlargement in infection amongst other things. So here's an example um, of a ceramic on ceramic hip construct that's infected. So the image on the left is an axial MRI uh, proton density or intermediate signal um, sequence that demonstrates a rather thickened and uh, multilamellated synovium within the pseudocapsule that is disrupted posteriorly. And that's what the white arrow is pointing to. The black arrows on that image on the left also demonstrate those loculated fluid collections in the posterior soft tissue envelope. And they would be running very close to the sciatic nerve. The center image is a coronal MRI stir sequence that demonstrates bone marrow edema, both within the ilium um, in the pelvis, but also around the uh, proximal stem. And there's also some adjacent soft tissue edema outlined by the gray arrows. So these are um, worrying signs for infection. And again, the patient went on to have an ultrasound guided aspiration of the posterolateral um, loculated fluid collection, which was then sent off to microbiology to see whether we would find any growth um, and sensitivity. Moving on to periprosthetic fractures, the overall instance um, is, you know, it ranges from something that's very low at 0.1% up to almost a fifth of patients. But periprosthetic fractures mostly tend to occur around the femoral component. And the common etiology factors tend to be osteolysis or loosening or trauma, particularly previously treated fractures that have then on, gone on to um, refracture. There is a classification system based on the Vancouver classification that depends on the fracture location, um, looks at the implant instability as well as bone stock. And all of these features can affect the prognosis and subsequent guide uh, surgical management. The Vancouver classification recognizes three femoral zones. They can be defined or broken down into classification A that focuses on the trochanteric region, which you know, we see the least the next most commonest tends to be classification C, where the femur distal to the component tip um, is seen. But the commonest area to identify prosthetic fractures is a Vancouver B, focused around the diaphyseal region of the implant, with nearly 90% of all prosthetic fractures seen there. Undisplaced or minimally displaced fractures can be managed conservatively with protective weight bearing. So not all prosthetic fractures will need to go on to have surgical management. But in the cases of non-traumatic periprosthetic fractures, it's crucial to consider an infection workup and an infection must be excluded in the first instance. Here's an example of a superior ramus fracture on an MRI scan. Uh, this is on a patient with a metalon polyethylene um, construct. So the radiograph image on the left demonstrates periosteal reaction along the iliopectineal line that we know now um, based on the earlier radiograph that we saw. Uh, and that's delineated by the black arrow. And then you can see some periacetabular lucency um, delineated by the smaller white arrow. And then just around the femoral neck, you have heterotopic ossification um, involving, the medial, involving the medial femoral neck. The uh, middle and right images demonstrate coronal MRI sequences suggesting bone marrow edema. And you can also pick out the low signal fracture line, um, which is delineated by the black arrow involving that superior ramus with associated bone marrow edema. So those changes on the plain film should indicate and point um, to a potential abnormality in that area that requires further imaging correlation. Moving on to heterotopic ossification, uh, in, in HO, you have the formation of mature lamella bone with both trabeculae and cortex in non-osseous tissues. Again, heterotopic ossification has a classification that relies on the, on the Brooker classification. And the best imaging modalities to utilize for this would be X-ray, but also CT, particularly with its ability to reconstruct into um, multiple planes. So again, this is the same patient that we saw in the previous slide with heterotopic ossification. And you can see the HO actually a lot more better delineated on the X-ray compared with the MRI, where it's very easy, particularly on the image on the right, which is a search sequence, to kind of walk over that area completely. And it's easily missable on MR. So HO is best evaluated with plain films and CT. Moving on to tendinopathies. So in tendinopathies, you can get disorders, particularly around the peritrochanteric region. Um, and this can be a, a large cause for post hip replacement morbidity in patients that present with lateral hip pain involving the hip abductors. 
So trochanteric bursitis with fluid distension and inflammation is the commonest presentation with that greater trochanteric pain syndrome. But you can also get gluteal medius and gluteal minimus partial tendon tears or even full thickness tears as well as tendonitis. So these are crucial areas to consider um, for further imaging. On x-ray, you may find um, periprosthetic fractures as well as greater trochanteric avulsions. And also, don't forget that HO can also cause impingement upon the adjacent abductor tendons to lead to GTPS or greater trochanteric pain syndrome. Abductor tendon tears are, however, better seen on ultrasound and MRI. So I'd always recommend that you would choose one of those two, if not both, to assess the tendons and the muscle bellies. If you had an x-ray, they may just show some subtle cortical irregularity of the greater trochanter, but it won't, it won't identify the tendon tears if there is any. On MRI, tendinopathies tend to present with a thickened appearance of the tendons where they've lost their normal low signal appearance usually. You can identify small partial tears um, or full thickness tears and tendons can often retract, particularly in the context of those big fluid collections when you have um, metal um, or uh, wear-related debris and synovitis, sometimes those fluid components can retract those tendons and you can see them often detached and floating uh, on MRI scans. But other things to look out for around the tendons or in the peritendin uh, paratendinopathy areas include bursal fluid distension and peritendinous soft tissue edema. Here's an example on MRI on a patient with a metal and polyethylene revision um, of abductor tendinopathy. So the image on the left is a coronal image that demonstrates a torn gluteal medius tendon. And you can see that's highlighted by the white arrow on the image on the left. And the gray arrow demonstrates quite marked muscle atrophy in where one would expect to see gluteal medius in particular. The gray arrow actually delineates the gluteal minimus tendon, which is intact, but again, there is functional um, deficiency given the degree of muscle atrophy here. The image on the right demonstrates muscle atrophy from damage to the superior gluteal nerve. So not all muscle atrophy that you see is related to a structurally um, deficient tendon. Uh, here we have a, a nerve that's been damaged um, in intraoperatively and that's led to a postoperative limp rather than a frank abductor tendon tear with associated muscle atrophy. Iliopsoas impingement um, is something that I see quite a lot in my practice, so although the, the kind of complicating features of this is generally quite low. Uh, here's an example on a patient with a metal on polyethylene revision. Uh, we can see an acetabular screw on the plain film, but on the MRI scan, we can actually see that that screw has penetrated through the cortex um, of the ilium, and it's actually invaginating and irritating the iliacus muscle um, deep in the pelvis. And this patient presented with groin pain. Other features for iliopsoas irritation that can be seen include um, hip constructs where the, uh, the anterior socket, if you like, of the, of the acetabular component is slightly proud of the margin um, around the anterior acetabulum. And this could be due to a number of reasons. It could either be replaced um, prominently with the socket overhanging anteriorly, there could be an oversized uh, uh, socket, or there could be a malpositioned acetabular component. And these are the things that we want to assess with um, initially with x-rays, but also CT scans are quite useful, particularly if you can reconstruct them into the axial oblique planes to be able to assess the anterior margins of the sockets in particular. Often with iliopsoas irritation, dynamic assessment re reproduces the pain um, with irritation to the overlying tendon. And I see these patients a lot in ultrasound, um, often to give them um, both a diagnostic scan, but also at the same time, a therapeutic injection of corticosteroid and some anesthetic just into the uh, psoas tendon sheath to see if the patient makes a positive response. Uh, so that's a, a relatively conservative way of managing uh, iliopsoas irritation or impingement. And those patients that do respond with injections can go on to potentially have an iliopsoas tendon uh, uh, tenotomy, if you like. And I know um, one or two of my close surgical colleagues do perform this. So the image on the top here is a sagittal MRI image that demonstrates a slightly protruded and prominent anterior socket just beyond the native acetabular margin, which is invaginating into the psoas tendon causing irritation 
uh, and impingement. The image on the bottom demonstrates a different patient where the tendon's actually torn. And now you can see the black arrow highlighting where the tendon has retracted too. Um, and this was on a background of severe tendinopathy. So it's worth remembering also that not all patients that present with psoas related groin symptoms is due to a malpositioned um, uh, socket. You know, there can be patients that often have pre-existing tendinopathy um, and we should not forget that. Briefly touching on nerve damage, um, these constitute a very low percentage of complications following arthroplasties. Um, it's more commonly seen, however, in revision surgery or acetabular reconstruction, particularly in the setting of underlying acetabular dysplasia. The sciatic nerve commonly is involved due to where its position is. And we've seen in the previous slides how even um, periprosthetic infections or wear-related synovitis can cause um, sciatica or sciatic nerve irritation. Other nerves to also not forget about do include things like the superior gluteal nerve, which we've already seen an example of, the lateral femoral nerve um, with patients presenting with anterior thigh pain with the burning nature to it and also the femoral and obturator nerves, which are less commonly involved in terms of damage. So during surgery, nerve damage can be caused either by direct transection, um, by nerve traction, or by nerve ischemia from compression due to adjacent mass effect from surrounding post-operative seromas or hematomas. Dislocation events, post-operative hematoma, and tendinal avulsions can also lead to nerve damage, but also let's not forget the heterotopic ossification examples and adverse local soft tissue reactions as well. Finally, just towards the end of the talk here, and this is probably more of a message for my um, radiology colleagues about the importance of being valuable in the reporting to our orthopedic um, surgical colleagues. You know, I very much try and stay away from the term stable appearances or no change to previous radiographic imaging. You know, what does that mean? And that's something that I don't like seeing in reports. I always say to my trainees to make sure that when you're reporting x-rays to look at all previous serial imaging, and that does include preoperative films as well. It's crucial, it's very important. So here's an example. Um, this is a radiograph and you can see a cemented hip construct here and the red arrows are pointing to uh, this kind of uh, lysis around the, 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 the acetabular component in all three zones. Um, the image on the right was a subsequent radiograph, which was, sorry, the image on the left rather was a pre-existing radiograph. And with this, the, the report suggested that there was increasing osteolysis um, around the, the, the socket. Now, if you compare all the imaging that this patient had, the image on the far left is the first post-operative image. And you can see if you carry on um, going from left to right, progressively you see um, osteolysis around the, the socket here, delineating lucency. So it's very important that you can paint a picture by looking at all the imaging rather than just relying on one or two images. Here's an example of, an uh, of, of preoperative imaging and why it is important. So uh, the red arrow points to a lucency just at the superlateral aspect of the acetabular margin there, just around the socket. And concerns were raised about potential loosening or infection. But if we go back, um, oh, I seem to have lost a slide here. Um, I did want to show an image of, um, a preoperative scan that basically demonstrated a degenerative geode um, or a subcortical cyst in that same area. So it was there before surgery. So that was not, that was you know that was what that lucency was essentially. This was not a concern for infection or, or loosening. So um, in summary, and some take-home messages really from the talk I've I've had today was was going through the different imaging modalities. Um, from x-rays to ultrasound, CT and MRI, and hopefully I touched on how to use them and when and why and what were the kind of main advantageous appearances of all the different imaging modalities. We looked at what normal hip replacements will look like, both on plain film um, and also on cross-sectional imaging, followed by the complications that one can see with hip replacements. And very crucial, make sure all previous serial imaging has been um, reviewed and that's it, and I'm happy to take any questions, uh, but thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for your fantastic talk. This is very relevant to every orthopedic surgeon. And a uh, few questions. Uh, do you think we can pick loosening, aseptic loosening by doing a bone scan 
earlier. For example, someone presents with a thigh pain. Okay. Sorry, somebody presents with a thigh pain, say eight years down hip replacement. Do you think we can pick aseptic loosening by using a bone scan or an MR? Yeah, so it's, it's very difficult. And in practice, you know, these are the kind of problems that we have all the time. And, you know, as a result, we we at our institution at Writington, we have regular uh, weekly MDTs, particularly to discuss such complex cases. So usually patients will already have serial radiographs. And one of the key things is to kind of go back and look at all these serial radiographs to look for any progressive changes of osteolysis on the scan, number one. Um, there are certain features where you can get um, things like infection that demonstrates quite aggressive bone loss, but you can also see that in chronic aseptic loosening. So what we tend to do as a protocol at our institution involves not just doing the plain films, but we may rely on some cross-sectional imaging such as CT or MRI to look for any signs of eccentric osteolysis, but also looking for any bone marrow edema or any other infective features like soft tissue, uh, periarticular soft tissue changes. Um, Bone scan and spec CT are things that we're now progressively moving on to on a regular basis with anyone that has um, some kind of joint arthroplasty, whether it's in the lower limb in the context of this talk or any other uh, body part. And in the bone scan, there is a described typical pattern of appearance that one would expect to see if infection was considered. And usually you would we'd run a triple phase bone scan where you take images immediately in the kind of arterial phase, one um, in a dynamic phase and, and then a delayed phase. And on those three different phases, one should see a steadily progressive increasing uptake around the prosthesis where there may well be um, areas of loosening. If you see steady increasing uptakes in all three um, phases of the bone scan, then that usually, or I should say favors infection. It doesn't mean it is, because um, often we've found out that these patients then present with normal bloods or clinically they behave in quite quietly and without major concern for infection, but the bone scan appearances suggest infection. And then if you combine that with something like SPET CT, which is what we use in our center, but I know other centers may use PET CT, you know, SPET CT is a, is a hybrid form of imaging that combines functional and anatomical aspects. So the SPET, again, um, we'll be looking for any functional activity around the bone and the CT component gives you an anatomical um, impression of what the bones look like. And we try and put both those things together, but it's not easy. It's, it's not easy. Thank you, Subhashish. And can you elaborate something more on the spec? I don't know spec was once, for example, we use spec to say a diagnosis of spondylolysis at one point of time. And last 10 years, it was not very much in vogue. And with your presentation, I think spec is going to come back. So what is the additional inventory that you need for a spec? Is it part of the CT scan or how is it? It's I know it's single photon emission. So what is it? Uh, does it have an isotope along with it? Yeah, so the technician, the technician bone scan um, is the isotope bone scan, whereas SPECT looks at single photon emission of, of CT, where you in, there's an injection of um, radio tracer isotope, and you're looking at the emission of that um, in, in kind of osteoplastic activity. So with SPECT is a nuclear medicine study, and it's something that I don't um, routinely report, um, but it's reported by our nuclear medicine colleagues, and that department in itself has massively expanded. And when it comes to reporting such cases, um, we liaise quite closely with our nuclear medicine colleagues to ensure that we uh, can interpret the imaging in the correct context. What's important, however, with both these nuclear medicine imaging um, scans, whether it's SPET, CT or bone scans, is to make sure you don't image them too early with those studies because of the um, heightened false positive rates that uh, are taken up. So, you know, usually we say um, as a rule of thumb, after surgery, if you're going to go for a bone scan, I would suggest waiting for about 12 months, one year postoperatively at least, to try and minimize any false positives. And with SPEC CT, it's even longer. Uh, my colleagues suggest 18 months or so at least. The longer the delay, the better it is in reducing those risks of getting false positives. And it's also important to know that sometimes you can open more um, worms out of the can because SPEC CT can often find lots of areas of activity, but then we can't really account for that on the anatomical CT component. Um, so uh, usually you have to be very mindful that, you know, as well as false positives, there can be false negatives as well.
Um, so that's something, you know, it's work in motion, but I do feel that as we better understand the implications of this, this will become a very important and regular part of any kind of uh, imaging workup for, uh, for hip arthroplasty. Thank you, Subhashish. And what about uh, MARS sequence, metal artifact reduction sequence? I mean, do you have it along with the routine 1.5D or is it an additional software or the hardware that you add to your MR? So metal artifact reduction sequences are available on pretty much most vendors. Um, and it's a technique that's used by radiographers. So radiographers should be able to manipulate how they acquire the sequences. Um, just like, you know, if, if, if you or me are looking at some kind of imaging and we manipulate the image by windowing it with our, with our PAC system, you know, in the same kind of, in a similar way, the radiographers, when they're actually acquiring the different MRI sequences, they can tweak some of the parameters of, 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 the, of, the, of the MR scanner to try and optimize the tissues around metalwork. Now, I must say that's not routinely done in a standardized fashion everywhere. And, you know, I often see imaging from lots of other places as well, where the quality of the metal artifact reduction isn't optimized. So though they have done Mars sequences, those Mars sequences haven't actually been optimized and they can be improved on. And that's something that the radiologist and the radiographer should try and work together in, in the department alongside the orthopedic surgeon to try and optimize, because as far as I'm concerned, if I can see a nice interface between metal work or prosthesis and bone, um, as we saw with some of the images, then you know you can really evaluate those um, the, the kind of interfaces, if you like, to look for those subtle osteolysis areas. So you know it's again work in motion, and you know we had to work long and hard with our radiographers um, to develop that, and now I feel we we can do we can do things very well. So Mars is available in both 1.5 and three Tesla. Um, the theory would suggest that scanning metal work is a lot better on 1.5 or lower magnetic field strengths. We know 3T can produce beautiful images, but at the same time, they may not produce the best images if someone's got um, a joint replacement in situ. But there are Mars sequences and the vendors are working constantly to try and optimize and improve their softwares for the scanners to, to improve um, the Mars sequences on 3T. Thank you. and. Uh... You mentioned about pseudotumors, right? And do you see a declining incidence of pseudotumors? Because you work, you work very closely to a very big and famous center for hip surgery. And all the metal on metal were implanted somewhere between some 2002 to 2012, after which there was an advisory against uh, metal on metal, right? So do you think there's a declining incidence or is it still the same? You're absolutely right. And maybe my, my clinical practice is slightly skewed because of where I work and, and, and the kind of cases that we see on a, on a regular basis. Um, I must say newer presentations of such is certainly less, but we do, we do see our fair share, you know, as a regional center, a lot of patients get referred from around the region or from around the country. And we often find those pseudo tumors on MRI scans. And, you know, again, when it comes back to our MDT, we often review um, cases where patients tend to be asymptomatic, but they have metal on metal, pre-existing metal on metal hip constructs, but they're completely asymptomatic, yet the imaging suggests pseudotumors. So uh, the question mark is, what do we do here? Um, if the patient's functioning well um, and they're able to do all their activities they wish to do, um, do we let them carry on? Um, usually we do, and every patient's different. Um, but if they are happy to carry on, we probably would do, but it does depend on how much damage they, there is. Um, and these patients will always be under some form of surveillance. So they do come under surveillance at our center to make sure that they're investigated regularly with plain film follow-up to ensure there's no progressive osteolysis. Um, they'll usually have regular um, blood tests to look for the cobalt chromium levels and the ratios. Um, and then we did used to do uh, annual uh, surveillance MRI scans to look at those pseudo tumors. But in a recent study that we published at our center revealed that even with annual surveillance imaging, you know, more often than not, the pseudo tumors would be stable. So, you know, there is no right or wrong answer really as to when uh, one should image, but it's important that there is some form of imaging to make sure that the degree of pseudo tumor doesn't worsen because that will then make any subsequent revision surgery more complicated. Thank you, Shubhashish. I think that's all the questions that we have for the session. Fantastic lecture and great discussion later on, because this is very, very important for every orthopedic surgeon to understand all about imaging. Thank you so much for joining in, Shubhashish. Thank you so much for the invitation. I hope that was very useful. Appreciate Thank it. You.